Hello everyone. I am myself Dr. Rajesh Gubba. I am the general medicine educator. So, in this session I'll just do a quick recall of the November INICT questions. So, this will be mainly the general medicine questions. So, the paper related to the general medicine was like a mixed type. You have some very easy questions and you have some little difficult questions. So, let us try to recall all the questions. So, the first question is Following image is given where a physician is performing an ankle jerk. In which of the following condition the ankle jerk is exaggerated? See, the image may not be the same like what you have got in the exam, but the student said, Sir, it was an image of ankle jerk. So, the options are the lower motor neuron lesion, upper motor neuron lesion, radiculopathy, and then polyneuropathy. So, please remember. In which conditions you have exaggerated reflexes, you have that in case of upper motor neuron lesion, right? Whereas in case of lower motor neuron lesion, what will happen to the deep tendon reflexes? The deep tendon reflexes will be absent in case of the lower motor neuron lesion. And you take the lower motor nerves, like where will be the, which, which particular part do you consider the lower motor neuron? Anterior horn nerve roots, peripheral nerves neuromuscular junction and muscle. These components they come under your lower motor neuron. So even in case of your radiculopathy or even in case of your polyneuropathy. So your radiculopathy and polyneuropathy they also come under your lower motor neuron lesion. So in lower motor neuron lesion what you will have is you will have absent deep tendon reflexes. Whereas the one where you have the exaggerated deep tendon reflexes will be upper motor neuron lesion. So, which part of, which parts do you consider upper motor neuron like cerebral hemisphere, corticospinal tract, brain stem, right? So, they come under your upper motor neuron and that too within the brain stem, it is a corticobulbar tract which comes under your upper motor neuron. So, in upper motor neuron lesion, you will have the brisk reflexes or exaggerated reflexes. Next question. Right. This is another important image which has been asked. What is the sign elicited in the image? Babinski sign, dysdidocokinesia, astereognosis, Wartenberg sign. So, it is like a very uh, simple question. What has been elicited here is the Babinski sign. Now, what about the other options and what are the various other methods of eliciting the Babinski? So, a quick recap of the Babinski. So, how will you elicit this plantar reflex? You have to give a blunt stimulus from lateral to medial aspect of the foot and this will be the normal response where you have right normal response is what where you will have flexor response which is a normal response and what is the Babinski sign Babinski sign is that where you have extension of the great toe and fanning out of the other toes and this is suggest you of upper motor neuron lesion and what are the various other methods of eliciting this particular plantar reflex one is your opening sign where you need to rub over the shin of the tibia. If there is upper motor neuron lesion, there will be extension of great toe and fanning out of the other toes. Next is the Gordon's method. Gordon's method is that where you need to squeeze the calf muscles. And if there is upper motor neuron lesion, there will be extension of great toe and fanning out of the other toes. The other is the Chedox method. Chedox method is that you need to apply the blunt stimulus over the lateral aspect of the foot. Right? Over the dorsum of the foot laterally and if there is upper motor neuron lesion there will be extension of the great toe and fanning out of the other toes and so which has been uh, elicited here is the Babinski sign and what about the other options like dysdidocokinesia so dysdidocokinesia is what it is the condition where the individual has inability to perform rapid alternating muscle movements and where do you have this dysdidocokinesia? Dysdidocokinesia is a feature of the cerebellar lesions. Okay. And the other option like what you have is the astereognosis. What is astereognosis? It is the inability to identify object by the feel only. Right. So, what is normal stereognosis? Like you just keep this pen in your hand and close your, right? close your eyes. And for example, up with closed eyes, an object has been placed in your hand. So by just feeling this object, you will be able to tell that this is watch. This is what is called stereognosis. What is astereognosis? Astereognosis is inability to identify the object by feel only in the absence of input from the visual system.
that is called astereognosis okay and one more option is there yeah that is wartenberg sign okay so what is this wartenberg sign wartenberg sign is used in evaluation of ulnar nerve motor weakness right it is used to evaluate ulnar nerve motor weakness so how do you elicit this right how do you elicit this the wartenberg sign so how will you elicit is see patient is asked to hold the fingers fully adapted with metacarpophalangeal joint and proximal interphalangeal joint and distal interphalangeal joint fully extended the individual should adapt and when will you consider wartenberg sign to be positive wartenberg sign is considered positive if the small finger drifts away into abduction from other fingers then we consider the wartenberg sign to be positive so wartenberg sign is used for the evaluation of ulnar nerve motor weakness okay so in this question what is the answer now it is your babinski sign then you take the next question so the next question is by which of the following you will determine hbv hdv co infection and eliminate hbv hdv super infection okay you have to understand one important thing here so what is co infection and what is the super infection see if the individual is having the co infection in such case which serology of hdv will be positive that is igg anti hbc okay so co infection will be like chronic infection whereas what do you understand by the word super infection okay so there is an underlying hdv infection and upon that there is a hbv super infection or the individual is having hbv upon that there is hdv super infection so super infection it tells you it is an acute presentation right super infection tells you it's an acute presentation so how will you eliminate hbv hdv super infection so if it is an acute what will be the serology that will be positive related to your hbv that will be igm anti hbc right igm anti hbc so that tells you the it is super infection so the answer is what that is igm anti hbc antibody by doing this serology you can eliminate the super infection okay next now we have some questions related to the questions which have been asked on the ecg so what is the diagnosis of this ecg complete heart block first degree heart block second degree heart block ventricular tachycardia so right this may not be the same ecg but the students have said so that was the ecg of uh, you know uh, second degree heart block and how to identify it is a second degree heart block so in case of second degree heart block we have two types mobits type 1 and as well as mobits type 2 so in mobits type 1 which is also called wenckebax phenomenon there will be progressive prolongation of the pr interval and drop in the qrs complex whereas in mobits type 2 you will have constant pr interval right you have the constant pr interval and intermittent drop in the qrs complex so if you observe this very closely right so you take the pr interval of these complexes so you have a period and there is no qrs complex and again you have a pr interval and again you have a pr interval so if you observe this ecg complex the pr interval is constant but intermittent drop in the qrs complex is there so that is suggestive of mobits type 2 second degree av block then how will be the ecgs of the other options you take the complete heart block in case of complete heart block there is complete av dissociation the atrial and ventricular contractures they don't have any association that is so you see here you have a p wave you have a p wave you have a qrs complex you have a p you have a qrs again you have p there is some wide pr interval and again you have qrs you have p you have p again you have like p so if you observe Uh, closely here the atria are contracting on its own and ventricle is contracting on its own you don't have any association between right you don't have any association between the atrial and ventricular contraction 
and you also don't have the PR interval being specifically maintained. So this is the ECG of the complete heart block. In complete heart block, your PP interval and as well as the RR interval, they don't match at all in complete heart block. Okay. And the other option which we had was like first degree heart block. In first degree heart block, what is that you will have is prolonged PR interval. See, normal PR interval is 120 to 200 milliseconds. So, in case of first degree heart block, the PR interval will be more than 200 milliseconds. That's all. That will be the feature in case of first degree heart block. But if you see in our case, so how many large boxes is this PR interval occupying? This, uh, it is occupying, it is, it is occupying less than one large box. So, one large box is how many milliseconds? One large box, it is 200 milliseconds. So, if it is occupying less than one large box, that means what the PR interval, it is less than 200 milliseconds. So, it is not your first degree heart block. Then what about ventricular tachycardia? In ventricular tachycardia, you will have, it's a wide complex tachycardia. You have wide QRS complexes and mainly you will have ventricular complexes and you don't have a P wave at all. That will be the ECG finding in case of ventricular tachycardia. So, whatever has been given to you here is second degree heart block and that too Mobitz type 2 where you have a constant PR interval and drop in the QRS complex. Okay, next. Then followed by that, yes, so this was the other question. This is related to the valvular heart disease. All of the following conditions causes or all of the following conditions in case of mitral stenosis will have soft S1 except actually in case of mitral stenosis, what is that you will have? You will have a loud S1. Why is that you will have loud S1? That is because of pressure difference between the left atrium and left ventricle, the mitral valve will close with greater intensity and that is the reason why you will have loud S1. But what are the conditions of mitral stenosis where you will have soft S1? If it is like calcified mitral stenosis, the intensity of the movement or the valve mobility will be reduced in case of calcified mitral stenosis. Thereby, you will have soft S1. Then you take first hard block. Mainly in case of the first degree heart block. In case of first degree heart block, there will be prolonged PR interval. Whenever there is prolonged PR interval, you will have soft S1. Please remember, it is soft S1. And then associated with aortic regurgitation. See, if MS is associated with aortic regurgitation, there will be soft S1. Why you will have soft S1? Let me explain you the mechanism. See. In aortic regurgitation, what is happening? The blood from aorta is entering into left ventricle. During which phase? During diastole, the, the blood from aorta is regurgitating into the left ventricle. And at the same time, during the diastole, from the left atrium also, the blood will be entering into the left ventricle. But because of entry of the blood, from aorta to left ventricle in aortic regurgitation, what will happen to left ventricular endiastolic volume and as well as left ventricular endiastolic pressure? It increases. So basically, the left ventricular pressure increases in case of the aortic regurgitation during diastole. Now, even your left atrium also has to send the blood during diastole. So, how is the pressure there in the left ventricle? The pressure in the left ventricle is high in case of aortic regurgitation. So, the amount of blood which is coming from left atrium to the left ventricle will be less and the valve, it closes with lesser intensity. So, basically, left ventricular endiastolic pressure is increasing. The amount of blood which is coming from left atrium to the left ventricle will be reduced and the valve, it closes with minimal intensity. Thereby, you will have soft S1. Even in case of my, mitral stenosis associated with aortic regurgitation. Whereas in case of mild, moderate, severe, very severe MS, it will be the loud S1. Right? It will be loud S1. So, in calcified MS, hard block associated with AR, you will have soft S1, except that will be in case of your mild mitral stenosis. Okay? And we have one more question on the ECG. 
Right. So the question is, all of the following drugs are used in this patient with the following ECG except amiodarone, adenosine, beta blocker, verapamil. And what is the diagnosis of the ECG first of all? So if you closely observe, how is the rhythm? The rhythm, it is irregularly irregular rhythm. Right? It is irregularly irregular rhythm. So if it is irregularly irregular rhythm and along with that if you observe the P wave very closely, you don't have a specific P waves. Right? Whatever the positive deflections you are having here, they are the fibrillatory waves. So the diagnosis of this ECG, it is suggestive of the atrial fibrillation. Right? It is suggestive of the atrial fibrillation. So in case of atrial fibrillation, what will be the drug that should be avoided is the question. So first and foremost, for reducing the rate, we give beta blockers. And if the beta blockers are contraindicated, we give verapamil. And for correcting the rhythm, we give amidarone. So we have the drugs, we should give the drugs which will reduce the rate. We should give the drugs which will correct the rhythm. The one which will reduce the rate, beta blockers or verapamil, the one which will correct the rhythm will be amidarone. And we also give even ibutilide. But adenosine is usually avoided in case of patients with the atrial fibrillation. Now, what is the reason? Like for example, let us assume if a patient with pre-excitation syndrome, like what is that WPW syndrome? These patients with WPW syndrome, they are at risk of development of atrial fibrillation. And in case of WPW syndrome, if you give adenosine, that will further worsen the atrial fibrillation will get converted into the ventricular fibrillation. If you give adenosine in case of a WPW syndrome. So, we don't know what exactly is the cause of atrial fibrillation. So, in such case, you should not give adenosine if the atrial fibrillation is due to WPW syndrome. See, if it is not due to WPW syndrome, whether we give adenosine or not is the next question. As such, adenosine is not very much useful in a case of atrial fibrillation. And if it is secondary to WPW syndrome, if atrial fibrillation is secondary to WPW syndrome, if you are giving adenosine, that atrial fibrillation will further worsen where the individual will develop ventricular fibrillation. So that is the reason why adenosine should not be given in cases of the atrial fibrillation. So, so second question on the ECG. So first question on the ECG was Mobid's type 2 AV block and second question is the atrial fibrillation which particular drug should be avoided. And one more question was asked on the ECG, right, what is the diagnosis of the ECG shown below? Electrical alternance, ventricular bijamine, multifocal atrial tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia. So, some of the students said like uh, calibration, alteration in the calibration was given and some of the students said like sir electrical alternance is given. But anyways, so if you take electrical alternance, where do you get this electrical alternance? You will have that in case of the massive pericardial effusion. So in massive pericardial effusion, if you observe very closely, you have alternating, right, alternating large and small complexes, large and small complexes, large and small complexes, right. Why is that? Because in case of massive pericardial effusion, the heart, it behaves as it is present in the bunch of, I mean, it is present in a fluid. So it will be swinging anteriorly and posteriorly. Whenever it swings anteriorly, more electrical activity will be picked up. So you get a large complex. And whenever the heart swings posteriorly, lesser electrical activity will be picked up by the electrode. Thereby you get a small complex. And that is what is called the electrical alternance. So this is not the case of electrical alternance. So if you closely observe the ECG, what is that you are having in the ECG? You are having a normal complex and you are having a wide QRS complex. Normal complex and wide QRS complex. Normal complex and wide QRS complex. And to this particular wide QRS complex, are you having a P wave? No, there is no P wave. So, where do you think is the site of origin of this wide complex? The origin of, the origin of this wide abnormal QRS complex, it is from the ventricle. How can you say that? Because ventricular originated impulses, they are wide QRS complexes and they don't have P wave. And if you observe this 
frequency of these wide complexes every alternate complex is a wide complex every alternate complex is a wide complex so every alternate complex is a wide complex so what is it suggestive of it is suggestive of ventricular bigemini right ventricular bigemini then how will you rule out multifocal atrial tachycardia see what is the criteria for mac the criteria for multifocal atrial tachycardia is that in these patients the heart rate should be more than 100 per minute and there should be more than or equal to three different p waves right more than or equal to three different p waves that is what is called as mat multifocal atrial tachycardia so if you observe here okay let us just take up here this is one p wave and if you take the second p wave it is different from the first and if you take the third p wave it is different from first and second so that is enough for us now you are having three different p waves and if you take the rate it is definitely more than 100 here right it is actually slightly irregular rhythm is there but if you calculate by your 6 second method definitely the rate will be more than 100 per minute okay so the what is the answer here now it is a case of ventricular bigemini and ventricular tachycardia just now we have shown we have seen the ecg what is there in ventricular tachycardia you will have wide qrs complexes not like this narrow qrs complexes alternately okay so that is about the ecgs and right so and two questions were asked related to calcium disorder because like one was like morning session and the other one was like uh, evening session so in one of the session it is asked like the question asked was all of the following conditions are characterized by perioral numbness and tingling except so perioral numbness and as well as tingling what is it suggestive of it is suggestive of hypocalcemia that is your tetany so in which of the following options given you will not have the hypocalcemia hypoparathyroidism you will have hypocalcemia hyperphosphatemia where will you have hyperphosphatemia you will have that in patients with chronic renal failure you will have that in patients with hypoparathyroidism so in these conditions with chronic renal failure or hypoparathyroidism you will have the hypocalcemia then what about acute pancreatitis even in acute pancreatitis you will have the hypocalcemia see there are various explanations actually in uh, acute pancreatitis what we follow is apache criteria right apache 2 criteria but if you go back to the ransons criteria for acute pancreatitis one of the parameter is your hypocalcemia in case of acute pancreatitis and not only that in patients with acute pancreatitis there is like severe pain in the abdomen and that will increase the sympathetic activity right and once there is increase in sympathetic activity right what will happen there will be increase in your catecholamines and these catecholamines they can shift the extracellular calcium to the intracellular compartment and that can also cause the hypocalcemia right and the one where you will not have hypocalcemia is in vitamin d toxicity so in vitamin d toxicity what is that you will observe is hypercalcemia but not hypocalcemia right so the except is vitamin d toxicity right next then followed by that yeah so this is a table of the ransons criteria so at 48 hours you can see that serum calcium is reduced in case of patients with the acute pancreatitis okay now in the other session the question was asked related to hypercalcemia hypercalcemia is not seen in which of the following conditions vitamin d toxicity sarcoidosis hypoparathyroidism milk alkali syndrome so vitamin d toxicity definitely you will have hypercalcemia because vitamin d what it does it increases the calcium absorption from the intestine then what is sarcoidosis you have the non caseating granuloma and this non caseating granuloma what does it contain this non caseating granuloma it contains this very important enzyme that is 1 alpha hydroxylase right it contains this important enzyme 1 alpha hydroxylase so this particular
this particular one alpha hydroxylase what it will do it will increase vitamin d synthesis and that will increase the calcium levels so even in sarcoidosis you will have hypercalcemia whereas milk alkali syndrome right it is uh, anti uh, it is the uh, anti acid abuse even here you have hypercalcemia but in case of hypoparathyroidism you will not have the hypercalcemia what you will have is hypocalcemia okay that was the question related to the parathyroid disorders uh, like one session they asked hypercalcemia the other session they asked like hypocalcemia right the next question was related to the gastroenterology so 30 year patient with dyspepsia and epigastric pain for past 6 months has completed the regimen for h pylori that is amoxicillin clarithromycin and pantoprazole regimen for helicobacter pylori which of the following is the best investigation for determining the success of the treatment upper gastrointestinal endoscopy biopsy with urease test c13 breath urea test then serology see either for diagnosis or even the efficacy after the treatment what we use is c13 breath urea test actually you can diagnose even by urease test also but urease test is what it is like biopsy it is an invasive procedure what the patient will prefer the patient will prefer a non invasive test rather than an invasive test so the answer is c13 breath urea test okay but otherwise even with biopsy with urease test also you can diagnose that the h pylori is eradicated but it is an invasive so that is the reason why we will go with the non invasive test which is nothing but c13 breath urea test okay right and the next question was yeah right the next question was related to the grading of the dyspnea what is the grade of dyspnea in a cardiac patient with breathlessness on going to washroom so in cardiac patients like what is the scaling by which you can assess the cvrt of dyspnea is the nyha classification that is new york heart association classification in new york heart association classification what all parameters are taken into consideration number 1 dyspnea number 2 palpitations number 3 fatigue right that is cardiac patient whereas respiratory origin dyspnea that is been classified based on mmrc that is modified medical research council so the question asked is cardiac patients so your option c and option d are completely ruled out now whether it is nyha class 2 or nyha class 3 see nyha class 2 there will be slight limitation of the physical activity and ordinary physical activity right ordinary physical activity will cause dyspnea fatigue palpitations that is class 2 whereas what is class 3 class 3 is marked limitation of the physical activity they are comfortable at rest but less than ordinary activity there will be fatigue dyspnea and palpitation so going to washroom it is like less than ordinary activity so that will be nyh class 3 whereas nyh class 4 it is a severe form like where the individual will have dyspnea at rest whereas nyh class 1 there is no limitation of the physical activity right ordinary physical activity does not cause the dyspnea in nyh class 1 only on exertion the individual will develop symptoms that is what you will have in class 1 so that was about your the assessment of cvrt of dyspnea by nyh next the other question was about the cftr gene mutation so like where do you have cftr gene mutation that is in case of cystic fibrosis so the question asked is cftr gene mutation involves which ion and which mutation see it is very comfortable for us that it is 508 mutation right and that too it's a chloride ion but all the options has chloride ion but two options has 508 it is 508 mutation so your 708 is ruled out now which amino acid deletion is it like deletion of tryptophan or is it deletion of the phenylalanine remember cftr gene mutation it is mainly due to 
chloride ion and deletion of phenylalanine at 508 position okay and on which chromosome it is on chromosome 7 right it is on chromosome 7 okay right so that was about your the cftr gene mutation right and the next question was related to the neurocysticercosis. So the question is, what is the absolute criteria for neurocysticercosis? The point is very clear here. Neurocysticercosis. Okay. So if you see the first, that is A, it is an MRI where you have multiple intracranial space occupying lesion. Right. So you can observe very clearly that you have intracranial space occupying lesion with a scolex which is being present here. So you can see this scolex formation. Okay. Right. And you take option B. Even in option B, you are having multiple intracranial space occupying lesion. But how are they? These are like calcified lesions. These are like calcified lesions. So you, what is the differential diagnosis for calcified lesions? You can also have this in tuberculoma. Okay, you can also have in neurocysticercosis and even tuberculoma. Then C is muscle microcalcification. But what has been asked for us? Neurocysticercosis. Muscle microcalcification, can we take that for neurocysticercosis? It is a question mark. Brain biopsy, definitely you can demonstrate the scolex. Definitely you can demonstrate the scolex in brain biopsy. So your option B, right, that is your B. It is not definitive criteria for neurocysticercosis because your calcified lesions, it can be seen in tuberculoma. And muscle microcalcification, that is nothing but rice grain appearance, that is seen in case of cysticercosis, but not in case of neurocysticercosis. So, what will be the absolute criteria here? The absolute criteria will be your A and as well as B. Right? A and as well as B. Brain biopsy and as well as MRI showing the scolex formation there. Right? Then, like, how will be this muscle microcalcification? You see, this is what is your characteristic rice grain appearance. Right? This is suggestive of what? Cysticercosis, but not neurocysticercosis. Okay? So, what is the absolute criteria? The absolute criteria is that the histological demonstration of the parasite, which is nothing but biopsy, direct visualization of the parasite by fundoscopic examination. And evidence of cystic lesion showing scolex of the parasite on CT or MRI. MRI scolex was there, but CT was showing a calcified lesion. So, CT in the option which has been given to you, we don't take that as a definitive criteria. If CT was showing the scolex, then we would have taken even that also as a criteria. Okay. So, that is the reason why the answer is what? The answer is A and as well as B. And you see the next question. Right. A two-year-old child with thalassemia major, which is a very severe form of thalassemia, is brought with history of requirement of multiple transfusion in the last six months. So, multiple transfusion. So, what does this tell you? That the individual has developed or may develop secondary hemochromatosis, which is nothing but the iron overload. Okay. Now, which of the following is the best investigation for determining the iron overload? Liver iron concentration, myocardial iron or cardiac MRI, serum ferritin, non-transferrin bound iron. Okay, you take the liver iron concentration. See, preferably we don't do this. Why? Because in patients with hemochromatosis, they develop cirrhosis of liver. And in patients with cirrhosis, right, you don't have the coagulation factors which are being synthesized. So, when you do a biopsy, after which you do a liver iron concentration, by doing biopsy, the bleeding tendencies will increase, right? Because you are piercing, okay? But in these individuals with the cirrhosis, there is high chance of bleeding. So, biopsy, preferably, we will avoid, okay? Otherwise, what is the best confirmatory investigation? That is your genetic analysis. That is your genetic analysis in case of hemochromatosis, okay? Then, what about the myocardial iron or cardiac MRI? Yes, this is one of the recent... Uh, upcoming investigation but still it requires standardization for con for considering it as a best investigation then serum ferritin and non transferrin bound iron see what will happen in hemochromatosis is the iron depot increases so serum ferritin that would be considered as the best investigation 
actually if the option was given as the transfer in saturation that also would be the best investigation but what has been given here non transfer in bound iron so that is not correct so whereas percent transfer in saturation that will be elevated and what will happen to your total iron binding capacity decreases so like if you see the flow chart okay so in case of the hemochromatosis we will do iron indices like your ferritin levels elevated iron levels elevated total iron binding capacity decreases and what will happen to the transfer in saturation that will be elevated and how will you confirm the diagnosis that is by your uh, genetic analysis so among the options which has been given to you the best answer will be the serum ferritin the serum ferritin levels are elevated okay and the next question was related to the instrument right so the following instrument is used for bone marrow aspiration bone marrow biopsy the pleural biopsy liver biopsy so if you see here this is a clima needle right why you don't have a side screw right for your sala needle you have the presence of a side screw right you don't have a side screw here so this is your bone marrow aspiration needle and what is this needle it is your clima needle right whereas sala needle it has a screw you see here this is the sala needle where you have the presence of a screw but for clima's needle you don't have a screw and what were the other options like pleural biopsy so what is the needle which is used for pleural biopsy we use cope needle and the abraham's needle and this is how they appear right next the next option which has been given was given for you was liver biopsy needle so what are all the various needles that you will use for liver biopsy that is wim silverman's needle right this is how it will appear then true cut biopsy needle and then mengeni biopsy needle so these are the needles for liver biopsy so but the needle which has been given to you here is the bone marrow aspiration needle why we do why do we consider bone marrow aspiration uh, needle why because you don't have a side screw okay right and if it was a side screw was there then we used to consider we would have considered that as the sala needle okay so that was about the instrument yes this is another important question so this is like a mix like uh, pediatrics and as well as the general medicine so cyanotic heart disease with increased pulmonary blood flow is seen in tetralogy of fallow transposition of the great arteries epstein's anomaly hypoplastic left heart syndrome so tetralogy of fallow what is the hallmark feature like subpulmonic stenosis so you will have decreased pulmonary blood flow with cyanosis in case of tetralogy of fallow right epstein's anomaly what is epstein's anomaly it is a atrialization of the right ventricle right again you will have decreased pulmonary blood flow and these patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome they mainly present with shock right they mainly present with shock then you take this transposition of the great arteries so in case of transposition of the great arteries what is that it is like a switching right it is the switching of the great arteries so the iota it is originating from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery it is originating from the left vein so here you will have cyanosis and how will be the pulmonary blood flow there will be increased pulmonary blood flow so transposition of the great arteries you will have cyanosis with increased pulmonary blood flow now i'll give you a flow chart so these are the conditions you see here cyanosis increased pulmonary blood flow you will come across this in case of transposition of the great arteries truncus arteriosus single ventricle total anomalous pulmonary venous connection tricuspid atresia with large vsd and decreased pulmonary blood flow with cyanosis you will have that in case of the tetralogy of fallow tricuspid atresia with restrictive ventricular septal defect epstein's anomaly and pulmonary atresia so these are all the conditions where you will have cyanosis with decreased pulmonary blood flow so what has been asked for us is that increased blood flow pulmonary blood flow that is suggestive of your transposition of the great artery okay next followed by that So the next question is, what is the drug that has to be given preoperatively to reduce the bleeding during surgery in case of hyperthyroidism? See, in case of hyperthyroidism, what is that we need to do is, like, in order to reduce the bleeding from the thyroid gland, you need to reduce the size of the gland, right? You need to cause the shrinkage of the gland, and thereby the bleeding can be decreased. 
and what is the drug which will decrease the size of the gland and thereby decrease the bleeding so among the options which has been given to you you have like potassium iodide propranolol propyl thiouracil and as well as the steroid so it is your potassium iodide the iodides they decrease the size of the gland and thereby they decrease the bleeding as well and not only that this potassium iodide also reduces the chance of the thyroid storm in case of thyroid storm one of the drug we give is your potassium iodide because they inhibit the release of the t3 t4 into the circulation okay so potassium iodide it should be given preoperatively to reduce the bleeding during surgery in case of the hyperthyroid okay next the next question was related to the neurological disorder a very interesting question so a 30 year old patient presents with back pain and pain in the legs on walking so this tells that the individual is having some claudication pain okay so on walking 100 meters because of which she has to take rest and sit down so this is a classical description of the claudication pain and she also tells that the claudication pain improves on walking uphill as compared to downhill what is the diagnosis the options are lumbar canal stenosis tuberculosis hip burgers disease atherosclerosis so these two they will cause vascular claudication right these two they will cause vascular claudication so in case of vascular claudication what will happen to the pain on walking uphill on walking uphill the vascular claudication pain increases because on walking uphill the individual has to uh, use more energy right and the pain increases in case of vascular claudication but what is being given to us the claudication pain it is better or it is improving walking uphill that itself rule out your vascular claudication that is your burgers disease and as well as the atherosclerosis now we have two options tb hip and as well as lumbar canal stenosis now let us just see what is this lumbar canal stenosis see this is what is your lumbar canal stenosis where the spinal cord it is getting compressed between the lumbar vertebra and when do you think that these patients they feel comfortable so when the spine is flexed then in such case the compression of the spinal cord can be relieved now our patient is having relief of pain on walking uphill why is that so whenever we are walking uphill right what will be our posture slightly we flex right slightly we flex in order to reach the center of the gravity and whenever you are flexing what will happen to the compression over the spinal cord compression over the spinal cord will be decreased in case of lumbar canal stenosis whereas when the individual is walking uphill how will be the posture like straight posture okay or slightly extended also so in such case the pain of lumbar canal stenosis right the pain of lumbar canal stenosis increases on walking downhill whereas the pain of lumbar canal stenosis decreases on walking uphill so what is the diagnosis in this case the diagnosis is the lumbar canal stenosis so in patients with lumbar canal stenosis you will have a claudication pain and that will improve on walking uphill why because the individual slightly flexes the spine and thereby the pressure over the spinal cord will be relieved okay so this is about your lumbar canal stenosis and the next question which has been asked was child with cyanotic spells and there is ejection systolic murmur in the left second intercostal area and chest x ray is as follows the options are tetralogy of fallow transposition of the great arteries epstein's anomaly hypoplastic left heart syndrome hlh stands for hypoplastic left heart syndrome so ejection systolic murmur is present in the left second intercostal space and cyanotic spells are there that and that too like what is the shape of the uh, heart it's a boot shaped heart because there will be concentric right ventricular hypertrophy so the apex will be upturned in, if it is left ventricular hypertrophy the apex will be downwards if it is right ventricular hypertrophy the apex will be upturned so where will you have this you will have this in case of tetralogy of fallow 
So in tetralogy of fallow, you will have a synotic spell and you have ejection systolic murmur in the left second intercostal space. And what is the cause of ejection systolic murmur in left second intercostal space? That is due to subpulmonic stenosis. Okay. And chest x-ray which is suggestive of a boot shaped heart, this is classical in case of tetralogy of fallow. But and how will be the x-ray in case of TGA? In case of transposition of the great arteries, right, the classical description of the heart will be egg on a string appearance. So, egg on a string appearance is a classical description in case of transposition of the great arteries. And what will be the description in case of the Epstein's anomaly? Because the third option was Epstein's anomaly. In case of the Epstein's anomaly, the classical description will be a box shaped heart. Like you will have a cardiomegaly, a box shaped heart. That is what you will have in case of the Epstein's anomaly. And in case of the hypoplastic left heart syndrome, so you can see that the left side, that is left parasternal area, it is being shrunk. The part of the heart which is present in the left parasternal area is being shrunk. This will be the chest x-ray picture in case of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So, the answer in this question will be the tetralogy of fat. Okay, so this is very simple and easy question. Then, then you see the next important question. Yes, what is the true statement about neurogenic shock? Hypotension with bradycardia, hypotension with tachycardia, hypertension with bradycardia, hypertension with tachycardia. So usually, when we are using the word shock, there will be hypotension. So option C, option D, they are ruled out. Now. Neurogenic shock. Normally, whenever there is hypotension, what will happen to your heart rate as a reflex? The heart rate increases. But in case of neurogenic shock, which is due to spinal cord injury, along with hypotension, there will be also decrease in the heart rate in case of neurogenic shock. So, in case of neurogenic shock, you will have hypotension with bradycardia, but not with hypotension with tachycardia. So, this is very, very important point. Okay, so in case of neurogenic shock, because of spinal cord injury, there will be unopposed vagal action. Because of unopposed vagal action, you will have the bradycardia, but not tachycardia, right? So the answer is A in this question, right? Now the next important question related to neurology. So this is a very very important question. A person brings his 60 year old father with complaints of weakness in the left side of the body. He says that he shaves, right? The father shaves only right side of the face, right? Shaves only right side of the face and does not bath left side of the body. Does not bath left side of the body. When asked to draw the clock, he could not draw a part of the image. You can see that here. Comment on the site of lesion in the brain. Okay. So, what exactly is the diagnosis here? The options are right frontal, left frontal, left posterior parietal lobe, right posterior parietal lobe. So, this particular condition, we call it as the hemi neglect. Right? We call it as hemi neglect. So, this hemi neglect or we also call it as hemisomatognosia. Okay. So, in these patients, uh, they don't consider that left side of the body is existing. They consider that left side of body is not there at all. And where do you come across these conditions? Whenever there is block in the, right, whenever there is block in the inferior division. Right, inferior division of the middle cerebral artery. And which part of the brain has to go for development of this condition? It is non dominant parietal lobe. Which is the non dominant parietal lobe? That is right posterior parietal lobe. So, right posterior parietal lobe is the one which is responsible for the development of hemi neglect, where the individual cannot draw which is there on the left side or cannot. Uh, or will assume that the left side of the body is not exist. That is called as the hemi neglect. Okay. Next question. High anion gap commonly seen in which condition? This is one of the very simple questions. Okay. The options are metabolic acidosis, 
metabolic alkalosis, respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. So high anion gap, you come across that in case of the metabolic acidosis. Okay, so actually we have two forms of metabolic acidosis, high anion gap metabolic acidosis and non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Okay, and what are all the conditions where you will have HAGMA? You can just remember this cat mud piles and these are all the conditions where you will have HAGMA. And what are the conditions where you will have uh, normal anion gap metabolic acidosis? You can just remember this mnemonic that is used car and these are all the conditions where you will have normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. And how much is the normal anion gap? That is around 6 to 12 milli equivalents per liter. Okay, next. Now, after having discussed about the ABG, it was a very simple question related to the ABG. Right. So, there were like multiple permutations and combinations to diagnose about the hypothyroidism. Which of the following is seen in primary hypothyroidism? See, when you are using the word primary, where will be the site of pathology? The site of pathology is within the thyroid gland. The site of pathology is in the thyroid gland. So, the options which has been given is like free T4, free T3, reverse T3, total T4, total T3 and TSS. First and foremost, when we are using the word primary hypothyroidism, what should happen to your uh, T3, T4? T3, T4 should be reduced. But which T3, which T4? It is your free T3, free T4 that has to be reduced. And when we are using the word primary, what should happen to your TSH? The TSH should be elevated. Now, these we take and let us see for the options. So, you take option A. There is low FT3 and low FT4 and normal reverse T3. What is reverse T3? I'll tell you. And see, in case of primary hypothyroidism, total T4 and total T3 can be normal. What will be the problem in primary hypothyroidism is FT3, FT4 will be reduced. And TSH levels are elevated in case of primary hypothyroidism. So, the first option itself is the answer and you take the second option, normal FT4, low FT3, elevated reverse T3, where do you come across this condition? See, whatever the hormone which is released from the follicular cells will be T4. This T4 in the presence of enzyme 5-D-iodinase, it has to be converted into T3, right, it has to be converted into T3. And if there is any intercurrent illness or if there is any infection, what will happen? Your conversion of or your 5-D-iodinase, it gets inhibited whenever there is any intercurrent illness. In such case, T4 is not converted into T3. T4, it is converted into reverse T3. Right? This we call it as sick thyroid disorders. Or sick thyroid state okay so in this condition of sick thyroid, the t4 will be normal t3 is not formed but reverse t3 will be elevated so the second option which has been given to you is the sick thyroid state and in your third and fourth your uh, t3 free t3 to free t4 levels are not elevated at all so your C and D, they are like completely ruled out. They are not at all your primary hypothyroidism. So, what is suggestive of your primary hypothyroidism is the first option. Okay, next. Now, we will move on to the next question. So, if you see the next question, in the absence of antidiuretic hormone, the fluid leaving the proximal convoluted tubule is, see, where will be the action of your antidiuretic hormone that is at the level of collecting duct or the later part of the distal convoluted tubule right or the later part of the distal convoluted tubule so in case of the absence of adh why there should be problem in pct pct you will not have any problem so in case of pct the fluid that will be leaving in case of adh absence will be isoosmolar. If at all if there is problem, there should be problem at the collecting duct. So, in collecting duct, you will have the hypoosmolar mirror in the absence of ADH, in the collecting duct, but not at the level of PCT. So, at the level of PCT, you will have the isoosmolar urine in the absence of antidiuretic hormone. Basically, you can have this in case of diabetes insipidus. Okay. 
So in the absence of antidiuretic hormone, the fluid leaving the proximal convoluted tubule is isoosmolar. Okay. Where should be the problem? The problem should be at the level of collector. Okay. Right. And the next question which has been asked in the recent exam is related to thrombolysis. So the patient presented with ischemic stroke, in which of the following condition thrombolysis is contraindicated? Right. And how will you do thrombolysis with the help of tissue plasminogen activator? The options are age more than 18 years. Blood pressure more than 185 by 110 millimeters of mercury despite treatment. CT showing no hemorrhage or edema of more than one third of NCA territory. And option D, patient presented at three hours of symptoms. So, what is the indication for thrombolysis? Within 4.5 hours of ischemic stroke, you can do thrombolysis. So, option D, you can do thrombolysis. Right? And Age more than 18 years, you can comfortably do thrombolysis. And you take the option C. CT showing no hemorrhage or no edema of more than one third of NCA territory. You can do thrombolysis. Remember, if the ischemia is more than one third, if the ischemia is more than one third of NCA territory, don't do thrombolysis. Because if ischemia is like more than one third and you do thrombolysis, the ischemia can get converted into hemorrhage. Right? Can get converted into the hemorrhage. So don't do thrombolysis if ischemia is there more than one third of your MCA territory. So the point given is no. So in option C, you can do thrombolysis. Whereas blood pressure more than 185 by 110. If you do thrombolysis, there is increased risk of hemorrhage. So that is the reason why uh, high blood pressures are contraindications. And for doing thrombolysis, you have to reduce the blood pressure to less than 160 by 90 and then you can go ahead with the thrombolysis. So in which of the following condition thrombolysis is contraindicated? That is option B. So this is one of the direct table from Harrison. Okay. Next. Next question is, child presented with a severe acute exacerbation of asthma with SpO2 less than 80%. In treatment of this patient in emergency department, what will you give? First option. A is order an urgent chest x-ray. B. Nebulization with short-acting beta agonist for 60 minutes 3 times. Right? Within 1 hour, 3 times. Oral steroid, high flow oxygen. So, what is this case now? It's an acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma. And that too, how much is the oxygen saturation? Oxygen saturation is less than 80%. So, what type of asthma we consider this? We consider this to be a life-threatening asthma. Right? We consider it to be a life-threatening asthma. So, in case of life-threatening asthma, how should we approach? So, if you see this flowchart, if it is life-threatening asthma, you need to give salbutamol nebulization. Right, you need to give salbutamol nebulization that is almost like three times in one hour. And whatever might be the type of asthma for all patients, right? Whatever might be the type of asthma in all patients, you give the oral pregnancy note, and definitely the oxygen should be connected to the individual if there is acute exacerbation. So, what is the answer in this question? Right. Nebulization, yes, you have to give. Oral steroids, yes, you have to give. High flow oxygen, yes, you have to connect the patient to the high flow oxygen. But doing an urgent chest x-ray is not an immediate treatment which is required. So, what is the answer here now? B, C and as well as D. Okay. So, acute severe asthma, right, one of the precipitating factor is infection. Right? And subsequently, you need to know what is the precipitating factor and you need to give the treatment accordingly. But immediately, like you need to give Saba, steroids and high flow oxygen. Okay. And you take the next question. So, this question is related to the ARDS in ventilatory settings. So, the question is, a 35-year female with ARDS has or is on the following ventilatory settings and these are the blood gas values. PO2 is 50 millimeters of mercury. Right? Hypoxia is there. Fraction of inspired oxygen is 90%. PEEP is like 5 cm of water. Inspiration to expiration ratio is 1 is to 2. Which of the following changes in ventilatory settings will you permit? Increased 
the tidal volume, decrease the FiO2, increase the peak, change inspiration to expiration ratio to 1 is to 3 from 1 is to 2. So, patients with ARDS, they require a tidal volume of the 6 ml per kg, not more than that. Right? If you increase the tidal volume, there is chance of the barotrauma. So, preferably, we will avoid increasing the tidal volume. Okay? And decrease the FiO2. See, patient's FiO2 is like 90%. With 90% fraction of inspired oxygen, PO2 is 50. And if you reduce the FiO2, PO2 will further reduce. So, don't decrease your FiO2. And changing inspiration to expiration from 1 is to 3 from 1 is to 2, this is good in case of COPD or in case of bronchial asthma, but not in case of ARDS. So, in ARDS, you need to increase the positive end expiratory pressure. So, how much you can increase this up to? You can increase this up to 10 centimeters of water. And what is the advantage of increasing the peak? That will cause recruitment of the alveoli. That will cause opening up of the alveoli. Uh, that is what is the advantage of your high peak in case of patients with the ARDS. So, the answer in this question is increase the peak. Right? Increase the peak. Okay? Next. So, this is a table directly from Harrison. Low tidal volume should be maintained and high P or you need to do the recruitment maneuvers. Open the lung by high P. Right? And minimize the left atrial pressure by restricting the fluid, prone position, recruitment maneuvers and high frequency ventilation. Okay? And for high P, what is the category? Recommendation is recommendation B. Right? Then. The next question is. A 25 year female presented with photosensitivity on sun exposed areas like cheek, neck and she is also experiencing dyspnea on climbing the stairs. The image of the hands is given which antibody is used for diagnosis. Anti-DSDNA, anti-nuclear antibody, anti-centromere antibody, anti-histone antibody. Okay. So, like uh, photosensitivity on exposed area. Actually, what is given here? It looks like gotrons papules. But please remember, it is not gotrons papules. So, even your hand, the uh, dorsal aspect of the hand, that is also a sun exposed area. Whatever has been given to you, it is a photosensitivity of the exposed area. Right? So, photosensitivity and dyspnea on climbing the stairs. So, where can you have this? Which connective tissue disorder? you can have this in case of the systemic lupus erythematosus. Right, in systemic lupus erythematosus, what could be the cause of dyspnea on exertion? It could be because of pleuritis. It could be because of interstitial lung disease. It could be because of a rare condition called diaphragmatic myopathy causing shrinking lung syndrome. Right, so the diagnosis here is SLE. Which antibody is used to diagnose, for diagnosis? See, the most specific Right, most specific for diagnosing SLE will be anti Smith will be the most specific. And what is the most sensitive? Most sensitive will be your ANA. Right? So the answer here is the anti-nuclear antibody. What about this anti-DS DNA? Anti-DS DNA it tells you about the CVRT of the disease. It tells you about the CVRT of the disease. Okay, right. So, this is little critical question because you may go with the anti DS DNA, but the anti DS DNA is not the first line, like go with the A. That will help you in your diagnosis. Whereas, anti centromere, anti centromere, you will have that in case of localized scleroderma or in case of the crest syndrome. Right, in case of the crest syndrome. And what about anti histone that you will have in case of drug induced SA? Drug induced SA. Okay. So, this is uh, one question in one of the session and in another session, the question asked was like uh, salt and pepper appearance of the skin, right? So, where do you get this salt and pepper appearance of the skin? That is in case of systemic sclerosis and the question asked was the antibody. The antibody that you will have here is anti-topoisomerase, right? Anti Topo isomerase that will be the antibody in case of the systemic scleroderma. Okay, so salt and pepper appearance of the skin it is a classical presentation in case of systemic sclerosis. Okay, next then followed by that 
which of the following is correct about the cerebral perfusion pressure so how do you calculate okay first of all how much is the normal cerebral perfusion pressure the normal cerebral perfusion pressure is around 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury that is a normal cerebral perfusion pressure and how do you calculate cerebral perfusion pressure it is mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure okay mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure right and now for suppose if the intracranial pressure increases what will happen to cerebral perfusion pressure it decreases so that is the reason why we don't want raised intracranial pressure whenever there is raised intracranial pressure cerebral perfusion decreases and how do you calculate cerebral perfusion pressure that is mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure will give you the cerebral perfusion pressure okay next next question is related to neurology a 50 year male presented with left sided hemiparesis right it is pure motor paralysis damage to which part of the internal capsule leads to this presentation sublentiform nucleus anterior horn retrolentiform part posterior limb now in order to develop hemiparesis right that to a pure motor hemiparesis there should be damage to your corticospinal tract and which part of the internal capsule you have this the dense accumulation of your corticospinal tract in the internal capsule that is the posterior limb okay so if you take the uh, internal capsule so you have anterior limb genu and posterior limb so it is in the posterior limb anterior part you have the corticospinal tract right you have the corticospinal tract so in order to develop this particular hemiparesis the lesion should be in the posterior limb of internal capsule right next okay so if you see the next question a 10 year old child presented with hemibalismus with sudden onset of wild flailing movements of arm and legs which part of the brain is affected substantia nigra caudate nucleus subthalamic nucleus thalamus hemibalismus in order to develop hemibalismus where should be the site of lesion within the basal ganglia that is in the subthalamic nucleus right and whenever there is lesion in the substantia nigra there will be development of parkinsonism and whenever there is lesion in the <coughs> caudate nucleus, there will be development of chorea. Whenever there is lesion within the thalamus, you will have the sensory loss on that half of the body. Okay. So, and that is what is called Dejerine Rossi syndrome. Okay. You don't have the wild flailing movement if there is any thalamic lesion. So, the answer here is subthalamic nucleus where you will have the hemibalismus. Okay. Next. So the next question is, a 15 year old male child presented with hepatomegaly, involuntary movements, poor scholastic performance, his sister died at 5 years of age, eye examination is shown below, what is the diagnosis? So whatever this particular ring you are seeing here, right, where you have like a greenish brown hue, it is nothing but your KFA. Right, where do you come across this? You will have this in case of Wilson's. So, in case of Wilson's, you have macronodular cirrhosis, and that is the reason why you are having hepatomegaly. And in case of Wilson's, there is involvement of basal ganglia due to which there is involuntary movement and poor scholastic performance. And your Wilson's, it can be hereditary. So, that is the reason why sister died at five years of age. And whatever you are having that in I is a KF ring that is classical presentation in case of the Wilson's disease. Right? Next. You see the next question. So, a 40 year old female has several episodes of vomiting and as well as the loose tools. Okay? So, she might have developed some electrolyte abnormality. And she was managed at the periphery by IV fluids and hyponatremia was corrected. She presented to emergency department with paralysis, dysarthria, dysphagia, loss of consciousness. So it is like, how is the presentation? Like a CV, paralysis, dysarthria, dysphagia. What might be the cause? The options are inadequate fluid resuscitation, rapid correction of hypernatremia, rapid correction of hyponatremia, excessive infusion of IV fluids leading to the fluid overload. So, when will you get, see, because of the several episodes of vomiting and diarrhea, the individual might have developed a hyponatremia. And when the sodium is corrected rapidly, what the individual will develop? The individual will develop osmotic 
डीमाइलिनेशन सिंड्रोम ऑस्मोटिक डीमाइलिनेशन सिंड्रोम एंड व्हाट शुड बी द रेट ऑफ करेक्शन ऑफ द सोडियम सी द रेट ऑफ करेक्शन ऑफ सोडियम इट शुड बी एट टू टेन मिली इक्वल एंड विद इन ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स राइट सो दीज आर द डायरेक्ट लाइन Right, correction should be done at a rate of eight to ten milli equivalents per twenty-four hours. So, if it is, if there is like rapid correction of the hyponatremia, then you will get these features like paralysis, dysarthria, dysphagia, loss of consciousness. And why is that, or what is that? That is nothing but osmotic demyelination syndrome. Okay. Right. Now, you see the next question. Right. Very simple and easy question. Haman crunch sign. Where do you see this? You will have that okay DVT, pituitary apoplexy, uh, diabetes mellitus, pneumomedia sign. First of all, what is Haman crunch sign? Haman crunch sign is that with every beat of the heart, right? You will get a crunching sound. Why is that? Because the heart it comes in contact with the air pocket which is present in the mediastinum. So whenever the heart comes in co contact with the air pocket with each beat, you get a crunching sound, and that is what is called the Haman crunch sign. So Haman crunch sign is seen in case of the pneumomedia sign. Okay. Next question. Right. So this question uh, slightly difficult because the dosages have been put forward and slight uh, sort of confusion was there among the students. A 45 year man with hypertension has currently developed diabetes mellitus. Lipid profile showed low HDL, high triglycerides, high LDL. Which drug would be recommended? Atorva was statin 80 milligrams, Rose was statin 10 milligrams, Rose was statin plus phenofibrate and phenofibrate only. See, if the individual had only hypertriglyceridemia, like more than 500, then we should have given only phenofibrate. Okay. So, but this patient is having high LDL and high triglycerides. So, phenofibrite ruled out. And option C, it looks more tempting. That is rosuvastatin plus phenofibrate. I will come back to this again. And recently developed diabetes mellitus and dyslipidemia is there. And in case of diabetes mellitus, what is the most common dyslipidemia? That is hypertriglyceridemia. Along with that, this patient is also having high LDL. So, when there is dyslipidemia, you need to give high dose statins. Right? When there is dyslipidemia, in case of diabetes mellitus, you need to give high dose statins. Right? It is not your phenofibrate. Now, you take rosuvastatin. What is the maximum dose of rosuvastatin? That is 20 milligrams. But what has been given is 10 milligrams. So, rosuvastatin is also ruled out. And the recommendations according to American Diabetic Association is that you need to give high dose statin whenever there is dyslipidemia of both LDL and triglycerides in a diabetic patient. So, according to the recommendation, the answer will be atorvastatin 80 milligrams, but it is not your rosuvastatin plus phenofit. Okay, this atorvastatin it can reduce both. It can reduce your LDL and it can also reduce your triglycerides as well. So the answer is A in this question. Okay, right. So this was slightly difficult. Most of the students have answered C, but the answer is A. Right. Next. Now the next question is HIV positive patient presented with fever and non-productive cough and exertional breathlessness. There itself tells you HIV positive non-productive cough. Exertional breathlessness, very much suggest you of your pneumocystis gervaisi pneumonia. Chest x-ray is normal. Can it be normal? Yes. In early stages of uh, pneumocystis gervaisi, it can be normal. Later, 